Welcome to this episode of Firearms Friday from the Wyoming State Museum in Cheyenne. My name is Evan Green. I'm the firearms historian for the museum. And over the past uh, three or four years, I've been working with the staff to update information on the firearms in the museum's permanent collection. So what do we have here today? This is a Colt single action Army revolver, 45 caliber, and it is known as the artillery model. And it is a really nice example of that type of revolver. Um, we know a good deal about the history of this firearm, where it went and where it was, and I'm going to refer to my notes, if you'll excuse me, so I don't, I don't get any of these dates wrong. You may know that the Sing Colt Single Action Army was adopted by the United States military in 1873 as the side arm for the infantry and cavalry. The uh, cavalry model, as it was known, had a seven and a half inch barrel, so it was two inches longer than this one, which has a five and a half inch barrel. So again, it was adopted 45 Colt caliber, seven and a half inch barrel, single action six shot revolver in 1873. Then in 1892, the US military adopted the 1892 Colt 38 double action revolver. So again, this is a single action revolver, the Colt double action was uh, had, had a cylinder that came that hinged out of the side of the frame and was in 38 caliber. So in about 1895, the Ordnance Department began recalling from active service the cavalry model Colt single action army revolvers. And many of them went to the Springfield Armory where they were uh, in some cases refitted, refurbished, and the barrels cut to five and a half inches. How do we know that this revolver probably went through that process at Springfield Armory? Because the serial numbers on the various parts do not match. Normally that's anathema to collectors, but in this case it is an indicator that it is an authentic uh, artillery model revolver. Well, why did they cut the barrels off? Well. Uh, artillery guys were, were off and on the caissons and, and working with their artillery and they found the seven and a half inch barrels just to be cumbersome and hard to uh, manipulate and maneuver around comfortably in their, in their line of work. So then in 1898 we have the Spanish-American War. And as a result of the Spanish-American War, the United States came into possession of the Philippines. And the Philippine people basically traded one colonial power, Spain, for another colonial power, the United States. And there were uh, contingents in the Philippines who objected to that and wanted uh, the United States out of their hair. And in the process of those confrontations, those fights, the United States Army discovered that the 38 caliber Colt double action revolver was not a very good man stopper. The Moros were, were committed fighters and warriors, and sometimes they would take the full dose of six rounds from a 38 caliber revolver and still keep coming on. So at that point, they started shipping a lot of these artillery models to the Philippines. And I'm going to have to find the rest of my notes here, um, or maybe not. So in any case, uh, we, we're pretty sure, probably, that this one went to the Philippines. And then it came back to the United States after the Philippine insurrection was over. And at this point, it went back to Colt to be rehabilitated and refinished again. How do we know that? This occurred like after the turn of the century, 1901, 1902, when it went back to Colt. 
Well, there's an inspector stamp on the revolver RAC, which stands for Rinaldo A. Carr. And Carr was the inspector of these firearms when they came back to the Colt factory to be rehabilitated. And we suspect that uh, this may have been, the, the, the barrel and cylinder may have been reblued. Don't believe the frame was recase hardened, but perhaps they reblued the, the hammer and the back strap. So is there a Wyoming connection to this firearm? Well, once again, <laughs> depends on what you believe. So we're going to take a brief break here, and I'm going to take this apart so we see what's on the inside. Okay, so we pulled the grips off, and uh, Dean, our talented videographer, has taken some shots that will hopefully show what the stampings are in this part of the grip frame. Because on this side, it says Frank Gruard, F-R-A-N-K-G-R-O-U-A-R-D. And on the opposite side, it says Buffalo W-T for Wyoming Territory. So who was Frank Gerard? Well, he's another one of those uh, people who show up uh, in the history of the West and in the history particularly of Wyoming. He was born in 1950 in the Society Islands. He was the son of uh, a Mormon missionary who was in the Society Islands on a mission and a Polynesian woman. In 1852, the family came back to the United States. In 1853, his mother returned to the Society Islands. In 1855, Gerard's father abdicated his responsibilities and Gerard was adopted by another Mormon family. In 1865, he ran away from that adopted home, became an express rider and a stage driver in Montana. In 1869, he was captured by Crow Indians, uh, released, and was turned around and captured by the Sioux Indians. And between 1869 and 1875, he lives with the Sitting Bull Clan of the Sioux Nation. In 1876, Gerard became a scout for the United States military under General George Crook. He was present at the Battle of the Rosebud in 1876, early June before the debacle at the Little Bighorn. He was with Crook on the Horse Meat March and the Battle of Slim Buttes that same year as they pursued the Cheyenne Indians who were fleeing the scene of the Little Bighorn. So, um, back to our timeline. So he was a scout in 1876. The frame of this revolver was made in 1877. You'll recall that it is verified as an artillery model because the numbers don't all match. So it was shipped in 1887 by Colt was received by U.S. Ordnance, issued to the field, probably to a cavalry officer, in its original configuration of seven and a half inches. So in 1890, Wyoming becomes a state. So if we believe the stamping, which says Buffalo W.T., that was applied prior to Wyoming becoming a state. That's if it's a legitimate stamp, and I think there's some question. In 1890, Gerard becomes a deputy U.S. Marshal. He's stationed at Fort McKinney, west of Buffalo. In 1892, he is advisor to a Colonel James Van Horn at McKinney. And there is speculation, but not documentation, that he accompanied the cavalry troops from Fort McKinney who went to the TA ranch to rescue the invaders who came in to do the Johnson County Cattle War. So, um, was this really Gerard's revolver? And there are several things that make me question it. 
One is the stamping is really not a typical mid to late 19th century typeface. It is what you would call a sans serif face and there are not any of the little tails and wiggles on the letters. Um, and we look back at where this revolver was, where it went, and where we can document it that it was in those years. So in 1895, it went back to Springfield Armory, and then we speculate that it went to the Philippines and was there probably between 1899 and 1902. Um, in that time period, between 1900 and 1903 is when it was returned to Colt, got the RAC stamp, which verifies that it did go to Colt for refinishing in that time period. So Frank Garrard died in St. Joseph, Missouri in 1905. So when would he have had this revolver in his possession? He was certainly a scout. He was affiliated with the United States military. It is certainly possible that it's in its original configuration as a seven and a half inch barrel revolver that it could have been in his possession and he could have at that time had that stamping applied. But he didn't keep it for very long because it went back to Springfield Armory for its first refit. It probably went to the Philippines and then it went to the Colt factory for that final refit. So the other thing that I'm not gonna go into in any great detail is there were some strange things happened around the acquisition of this firearm by the museum. There was a guy named Loam who owned a dude ranch up between Cody and the east entrance of Yellowstone Park. And his story is that he bought this revolver from one of his Wranglers in 1915 for 10 bucks. But his revolver, his uh, Wrangler, went to town on the weekend, got into trouble. He had to go into town and bail the Wrangler out of jail. The Wrangler said, uh, geez, uh, you know, don't, don't tell anybody about that revolver I sold you because I stole it from an old army guy over by Buffalo. Well, that's a pretty convenient story, piece of the story, isn't it? Because the old army guy could well have been Frank Garrard, who certainly was not there in 1915, but we don't know how long that Wrangler alleged to have had the gun. So Loam kept that revolver until, uh, when did it come to the museum? Um, 69, it was acquired by the museum from a collector here in Cheyenne who had sold other firearms to the museum. And um, he contacted one of the curators, the firearms guy at the time, and said, geez, uh, I don't know that I can, I, I may not be able to deliver that revolver to you because Loam kind of wants it back. He made, he made a promise to that Wrangler back in 1915 that he wouldn't tell anybody about this gun and he would keep it in his possession. So, okay, you, you, this guy is, Loam is concerned about keeping his word to a guy who sold him a stolen gun 50 years ago. Somehow that, to me, doesn't wash. And then the collector here and said, geez, we, we heard that there's a name inside of that revolver. There's somewhere inside of that revolver, there's, there's somebody's name who, who may have been the owner of that revolver. So if you want to check that out, give my wife a call. You can go out and pick up that gun from her and, and check it out. And again, this, this, to me, doesn't wash. If you were a firearms collector, you knew that provenance, if you could establish that a firearm was owned by a character in the Old West, you could double, triple, increase by 10. If it had said George Custer under there, or Geronimo, or Wild Bill Hickok, it would have much greater value than Frank Garrard. So I just can't imagine that a collector, a, fire, a knowledgeable firearms collector would have not taken this thing apart. I mean, you take out three screws, uh, and there it is. So anyway. Uh, I think the report I did on this, I really went down the rabbit hole, it was 25 typewritten pages, 
And uh, as with some others, I really don't know for sure, but I, I seriously doubt that this firearm was ever in the possession of Frank Gourard. If you want to know more about Frank, there's a couple of books out there, uh, both of them a little sketchy, uh, but they will give you the story of Frank Gourard and his escapades in, in the Wild West in Wyoming and Montana. So He was much respected as a scout. Uh, George Crook was quoted as saying, I would rather lose a third of my command than Frank Gerard. And obviously, because he had lived for that period of time with the Sioux Indians, he had a very good feeling about their, their habits, their, their way of life, and would have been certainly invaluable as a scout, although I am sure the Sioux did not appreciate his turning his coat and uh, acting against them in the Sioux Wars of 1876. So there you have it. Regardless of whether it was Frank Garrard's, it's a really nice example of a documented Colt artillery model, and we will leave it to the fates as to whether or not Garrard ever had it. I don't believe that he did. So. If you have any questions or comments, give us a shout out at the museum. Uh, put the comments or questions in the section below, and we'll uh, try to respond to your questions and concerns. So that's it for this episode. Thank you for watching.